Hi, and welcome to the Desert Lady Diaries podcast, a weekly conversation with women who found their home in the Mojave Desert. I'm your host, Dawn Davis, and this is episode number 19. If you're a first-time listener, welcome, and if you're a returning listener, thanks so much for coming back. I was all set to tell you about an uh, exciting pilot TV series that came to town called Frequency last week and had used the Desert Lady Diaries podcast to seek out some folks to talk about why we live here in the desert and how it's changed our lives from living the status quo to living more freer, more meaningful lives. At the shoot, we had a conversation about our lives here, and then we were led in a heart-centered meditation led by Desert Lady Gabriella Nag. When the meditation was over, I was in tears, feeling this had been a very special moment in time. In just that place with those particular people, and it is with great sadness that I've just learned today before recording this intro and outro for this episode that one of those participants, Melanie Buck, passed away over the weekend. I knew Melanie before I actually moved here through using the services of the library. She was one of the librarians there, and I was house-sitting at a place here in Joshua Tree that had no Wi-Fi, so I would go to the library and download my scripts, and then I would go back to the house and record and edit them, and then come back to the library so that I could upload them to the client. And Melanie was always there, either handing me my printed-out scripts, and she had asked if I was moving here, and we had some conversation, and, and that's how we became friends. If you listen to the podcast regularly, you'll know Melanie. She was on episode number 12, talking about her dwarf goats, chickens, and getting ready to welcome their little kid fox, Joe Claude, into the world with her husband, Buck. Melanie loved this place, and this place and everyone who met her loved her. She's taken her light to another room, and while I'm heartbroken, as is this whole community, to lose her, I'm so grateful to have known her, if only for a short time. This week's guest is Yolanda Brown, wife, mom to two grown men and three chihuahuas. Yolanda talks about identifying her own political complacency and what she's doing to be the change. Today, my Desert Lady Diaries guest is Yolanda Brown. She was born in Los Angeles, California, and then when she was one and a half, her family moved to Mexico, but they moved back to the U.S. when she was 10 years old. She's married to a retired Marine and mother of two grown men and mom to three adorable chihuahuas. She is a member of the Indivisible Morongo Basin Organization, the treasurer of the Morongo Basin Democratic Club, and she's also part of Marge Doyle's Campaign for Congress. They're calling it the Kitchen Cabinet? Yes. Okay. Okay, we'll talk about that. (laughs) She's also an activist for undocumented immigrants, immigration detention centers, and social justice. And currently she's focused on raising money for bail bonds for the release of political asylum seekers in Adelanto Detention Center. And she's also starting a nonprofit organization to assist with their post-release expenses. And in her free time, if you can imagine after hearing all that, that she actually has free time, she enjoys hiking and running. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm going to start like I do with everybody. How did you come to live in the desert? Well, I came with my husband when he was stationed in 29 Palms. Okay. And this was back in 1997. And um, he was reassigned to go to Washington, D.C. In 2000, we moved over there for 10 years. And then we came back after we retired in 2010. Okay. And we've been here ever since. So you liked it when you were first here? Well, I... I loved it. I didn't like it. I loved it. <laughs> okay. The uh, first thing that I was told when I, we came to the desert to the 29 Palms base is that you're going to love it over here. 20 miles is 20 minutes versus in L.A. where we were living, 20 miles, it may take you about an hour, hour and a half, not about two and a half hours to three hours, depending <laughs> the time of day. Exactly. So that's that's how we came. When I hear that people have come here, I wonder how they found their community. So I usually ask how you found your community of people when you came to the desert. So it sounds like since your husband was a serviceman, that the service community was probably most of your most of your community. Is that true? Well, not when we first moved to the desert. I was still working. I worked for General Hospital, LAC, USC Medical Center. So I was making the commute, if you can believe that. Oh, my goodness. So I didn't have much time for anything aside from working and devoting my spare time to my kids and my husband, which was very little. In 98, there was an incident that happened with my youngest son, which prompted me to 
really take a look at my priorities and working, making that two hour commute just to one way to get to work was not worth the sacrifices that I was asking my husband to make, which was taking over everything that I was doing, doing the cooking, getting the kids to school and wow. looking after them, blah, blah, blah. And as a Marine, uh, he doesn't have set hours. So there were times where he could come and on time and pick him up from school and other times where they just had to wait. And after that incident that happened with my kid where he got locked out of the house and he called me that afternoon and he told me what had happened and it just broke my heart. And the following day I went and put in my resignation and never looked back. Wow, so good for you. After that, I just devoted myself to my family, friends, and my secondary family, my mom, my dad, my right. sisters, my brother. That's, so. It's amazing how some something can happen that can you just change your whole perspective on a dime. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And if I see young couples with kids, I always encourage them, if there's any possibility that one of them can stay home and raise their kids, to make the sacrifice and do that, because it was... One of the best decisions that I've ever made, stay oh. home and take care of my kids. Yeah, and I bet your boys are really appreciative of that, too. Uh, they are. They yeah. are. Now, probably back then, maybe not so much. Right. <laughs> well, are any of us at that age? No, Let's face not it. not really. But now in our conversations, I think they do appreciate it. I was a total soccer mom. You know, right. it's like, so it was a lot of fun for me. Oh, okay. Very great. Thankful for that. So you talked about you do a little running and hiking. Do you enjoy the park on a regular basis? Absolutely. Oh, good. Um, when I came out of my shell, I met a lot of wonderful ladies here that kind of took me under the wing and they started showing me a lot of the hiking trails mm -hmm. and I just absolutely love it. I try to go now as much as I can, which is not as often as I would like, Right. But I try to go as often as I can. You're very politically active right now. Talk to me about even where that comes from for you. Where did that seed, like how did you feel like, I just need to get involved in all of these things? That came when I saw Donald Trump coming down the escalator and talking about my community mm -hmm. being just about the worst thing that has ever happened to this world. And I, it got me a little incensed, but I thought it was just a joke. Mm. I didn't think much was going to come of it other than, you know, highly entertaining campaign that he was running. When he insulted John McCain and nothing happened, that kind of made me take notice and started thinking that he may have a chance if this man was being allowed to do everything that he was doing, he may have a chance. Unfortunately, Hillary, her bar was so high and his was so low mm -hmm. that I started getting a little bit concerned. Uh, November 8th, that's, um, it really rocked my world. Mm -hmm. I felt like I had been punched in the gut right. over and over again. Uh, when I woke up on the 9th, I just had this feeling of desolation, depression. I had to go through the morning process and right. try to figure out what I was going to do. I've always been kind of acceptance of our political role. I knew that no matter what, max, every eight years, mm -hmm. things were going to change. And so I've been kind of complacent about that, you know, no problem. I don't I, think I you're the I only one that's been complacent about it. I think it, we've all been a little complacent about it. And, and I didn't have the need to get involved aside, you know, from voting or making donations. I didn't right. feel the need. Within a week of the election, I was walking my three chihuahuas and there was this gentleman, I always lock eyes with people that I see coming mm. up the road. I've trained my babies, I call them my babies. Of course. I say car, and they move to the side of the road because one of them likes to walk on the actual road. When I say car, they automatically move to the side, and mm -hmm. they sit, and they wait for me to release them. So I lock eyes with the drivers because sometimes they do the texting, the phone calling, right. so i got to make sure that they see me. I was looking at this gentleman and he's looking at me and he starts kind of laughing and he veers the car into me <gasps> and I was exactly that expression that's what I had what? I, I couldn't believe it so it was kind of an intimidation tactic that he used and I really couldn't react I was just so shocked that that had happened sure um, I finished my walk I went home I was scared I, I was mad I really I didn't know how to process that I'm very self-conscious of what I look like how I sound but I really didn't think that here in this community that would happen so what I did I started getting my birth certificate with me kind of a security blanket because I know if I, I'm collateral 
a rest from eyes and I'm going to give you an opportunity to prove that I am sure. born here and you right. know, that I am a citizen. But it gave me some comfort to have that. Two days later, I went back, same road, same thing happened with another gentleman. This one, had I not actually jumped out of the way, he would have run me over. Oh, my gosh. So Did you report I, this to the police? No. I didn't even, I, there were both white vehicles. Uh-huh. And aside from that, I can't tell you. One was a, just a regular car. I'm uh-huh. not too good with models and everything. The right. other one was a van. The second one was a van. So it didn't even cross my mind to report well, anything. Yeah. But uh, what it did do is that I was not scared. I was very angry. Mm. And I went home and I thought, I have every right to be here as mm-hmm. anyone else. And then I started looking for some organization where I can involve myself with and really well, and do the things action. that I, yes, do the things that I wanted to do because I knew then that this is me. I know that I'm a citizen. I was born here. I have every right to be here just as those two white men right. feel they, uh, the right to be here. So I started thinking, well, where is the uh, community, my community, who are not documented? How are they feeling? Then I started getting, uh, looking around. I came across uh, Indivisible Morongo Basin, Mm -hmm. and it started from there. And now you're very involved. Yes, I am one of the co-leads for the Immigration Issues team. And Mm -hmm. yes, it's, I've been more focused as I learn more. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I said, I get out there more. I become more and more focused with the issues that are affecting the Right. Not just my community, but just about everybody that doesn't seem to fit mm-hmm. the uh, image of certain people right. running our administration. Well, and I think that's an important point because it also takes some time to become educated. And a lot of people either feel that they don't have the time to do that, they're not as passionate about it, oh, someone else will do it. But I think it also shows that many people were feeling that overwhelm and powerlessness. Like, there's so much going on. How do I process all of this, whether it's going on in the U.S., whether it's going on in California, whether it's going on in my own town or community, or whether it's going on in the world? And how do I take some sort of action and control to feel like I'm making a difference, that I'm making a change? And it sounds like you have found that and a way a vehicle to do that absolutely that's absolutely. great i had a conversation with one of my friends last week and i was telling her that every time i help someone who the administration is trying to get rid of i feel that's how i'm sticking it back to him because i feel his boot on my throat all the time but instead of retreating i jump into action Mm -hmm. and I try to take and I was kind of overdoing it at one point (laughs) so I I had to learn to just kind of focus on the things that I'm really passionate about and trust that other people uh, feel the same way that I that I feel Mm -hmm. and are doing their part right and you know and not no part is too small even if it's just one little thing Mm -hmm. you know making a a phone call every day or something yeah it's a collective effort so I'm okay with that being involved what's it like being involved with Indivisible Morongo maybe some people are not familiar with the Indivisible organization even can you just give a little high level background of what that looks like here in the Morongo Basin and what maybe the committees are and what they're working on or the teams. The model came from the Tea Party when Obama was elected. They saw how effective they were with uh, putting pressure on the congressmen and their senators and how they were able to assist the people in power blocking everything that Obama wanted to do. So this uh, Congressional Aides came up with this plan and take the same effectiveness that they had, they came up with this plan and they developed Indivisible. And our purpose is to go ahead and resist the uh, Trump agenda and by targeting our congressmen and our senators. Our senators, you know, they're Democrats, so we target them on occasion, Mm -hmm. but we don't target them as nearly as often as we do uh, Paul Cook, which is our congressman. Right. So there's a number of committees that are are active. What we do is we started taking issues that people wanted to work with. We had, at one point, we had healthcare, that's when the ACA was mm-hmm. going on strong, and right. then they switched over to SB 562. Right. And now, so that's been shelved. That committee has been shelved for the time being. Mm-hmm. We had the environmental issues team who were helping with the uh, Cadiz and with the Mojave and everything, all this, when they started trying to take our national parks, you right. know, they were active. 
We have the Relentless Callers, which are making their daily phone calls. The lady that leads the Relentless Caller has scripts that she forwards to all the members of the team. Okay. And they make the phone calls. We have the immigration issues team. And as actions come up, <laughs> mm -hmm. we have monthly meetings and anything in particular. And it's every day. Right. We, we really, we have to of choose course. our battles. Right, but exactly. But I mean, uh, we have monthly meetings and we come up with action plans mm -hmm. of what is going on, uh, whatever we're feeling passionate mm -hmm. about or whoever's willing to lead a certain right. action. Most recently, we had one on Sunday. Uh, right. About the tax. And I was unable to make it because usually I try and at least come for the the demonstrations, if you uh -huh. will, that you have out on the highway, which we had one after Charlottesville. Yes. After that incident, you guys mobilized really quickly, which I think is great, and put that together and get the word out so people can come and show up. Yes. So that that's about all the uh, teams that we have right now. Okay. And great. of course, we have the administrative team and the web team and, mm -hmm. you know, those... Thank you for that overview, because I'm like I said, I think that there are a number of people who are aware of it, but they may not know exactly what's involved. So now they can get involved if they if one of those pieces of the teams interest them, or they can reach out. And I'm going to put a link uh, in the blog post that I put when I put your episode out. That'll be there that people can connect to. Wonderful. And if I may just add, uh, we're nonpartisan. We are having a meeting to discuss that to see if we want to get involved in electoral work. But as of right now, we're nonpartisan. Understood. Talk to me a little bit about Adelanto. I didn't even realize it was as close as it is here to the high desert. Can you describe exactly what that is and how that works and then what your involvement is in helping those folks there? Absolutely. Adelanto is a detention facility owned by a private corporation, the GEO Group. They are under contract with our federal government. They make about 18% of their profits is through the federal government, which equated to $1.84 billion in 2015. Wow. So when the government decided that they were going to contract with private facilities to prisons or detention centers, mm -hmm. They started profiting. In um, 2016, Sally Yates came and they did a study and they saw that it was, they really don't have any oversight over what they do over the treatment that they implement at the private facilities. Oh. So she was going to rescind and start phasing out all the private contracts with private companies and the government was gonna start taking over running the prisons once again. Of course, you know, with the Trump rhetoric, that was dismissed as soon as he got uh, elected. We found out that uh, GEO made contributions to super PACs benefiting Trump and they also donated to the inaugural festivities. The following month after 45, I'm sorry, I have problems saying his name. I understand. After 45 <laughs> was elected, uh, Sessions came out and said that everything that Yates had started with the implementation of switching back to government-run uh, mm -hmm. prisons, he put a halt to it. So the prisons, you know, as soon as they, 45 got elected, their stocks went up. Uh, they started developing mm -hmm. plans to expand and oh, to dear. construct to new, expand. Yes, expand. Actually, Adelanto's expanding so right now. So that that immediately my mind goes to expanding means that is that a goal that we're going to expand the prison system? So that goal is finding and rounding up more people to put in a prison to make money. To put in a prison, well, they're supposed to be detention centers, but they are run like prisons. Oh, so many ways I can go with this, Don. <laughs> I'm trying to think of. Okay, you asked about Atlanta, so I'm going to stick yeah, with Atlanta. Yeah, let's, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any undocumented people that are coming or they're detained, Adelanto is one of the ones that they normally end up. There's one in San Diego, Ote and the one in Adelanto. Okay. So normally everybody ends up in Adelanto eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're seeking political asylum, you're not supposed to be incarcerated. And I'm going to say incarcerated because that's exactly what they do with them. Mm -hmm. And and you've been to the facility. To, yes, I right. have. Yes. Uh, I have been inside. I've been through the hearings. So mm -hmm. yes, I'm, I'm right. very aware of how they work. Right. So how I became aware of Adelanto was when I joined Indivisible and I started making connections with other groups and they told me that there was a rally, there were people that were in there. So 
there was a caravan from Central America that made it over here. Some of them immediately turned themselves in to the Border Patrol and asked for political asylum. Others uh, jumped the wall and they got detained, but all of them ended up at Atalanta. The uh, treatment there, it's very subpar. No medical facilities. They had medical issues that they were not being addressed. The food, they refer to cat food, extremely high bail bonds ranging anywhere between thirty-five dollars to $55,000. Now, these people that are coming here, they're fleeing violence, they're fleeing mm-hmm. poverty. They don't have, who has right. that kind of money? People here don't have it. Exactly. <laughs> so they were asking for the bail bonds to be lowered for better treatment from the guards, for better food, for mm-hmm. clean underwear. They were being denied. They were mentally abused. They decided there were nine from this caravan that got together and decided to go on a hunger strike. After they went on a hunger strike, they beat the crap out of them. Oh, my gosh. They busted their lips. One of them lost the bridge, got a elbow dislocated, and they pepper sprayed them. They were being disrupted by not eating, so that was their response by the guards. After they pepper sprayed them, one of them got pepper sprayed in the mouth, another one got pepper sprayed in the genitals, and they got him and they took him to the showers so they can rinse themselves off of this pepper spray. So in order to treat that, you're supposed to rinse off with cold water. And what they did is... They turn on the hot water, which exacerbated the pain, the chemical reaction. So um, one of the uh, young men that we got out was staying with me, and I asked him if he had been one of the ones that had been forced to go into the hot water, and he said no. As soon as they had him lined up, and when he saw, when they turned on the water and everybody started screaming in pain and jumping up and down, Mm. he said, I was like a cat. I was holding on, you know, they were not going to forced me to go right. in there. And if you were to say this man, he's all of maybe 130 pounds. Oh my and, goodness. You know, you have yeah. these parts that are very burly. So you can just imagine right. how he felt and how he was able yeah. to fight him off. Uh, so the administrators at Adelanto, they agreed to listen to their gripes, as they call it, and nothing happened. So they went on a hunger strike again By this time, there were some Haitian refugees that joined the hunger strike. And they started negotiating, and they put a stop to it. Nothing came up, so they did a third hunger strike. Back at it again, yeah. And by this time, every time that they were going to hunger strike, the war was getting out more and more. So that's how I got involved. I heard, you know, they're on a hunger strike. We're going to go and support. Mm. Uh, We will go and rally outside the facility. We will play music because they could hear it, so Mm -hmm. they will know that we were out there. Mm -hmm. And so what they would do when we would go and rally, they would close the facility down. So all the family members from the other people that are detained there, they travel. You know, sure. Atlanta from here is almost a two-hour drive. Right. And, there's, and it is so isolated. So there's people that travel at least two hours to go and see their loved ones. Mm-hmm. So they get there. And the facility is on lockdown because we're out there. So they say, well, there's... They're the reason. You go and talk to them. Uh You go and ask them why they're there. So we have all this angry family members Mm. from the people that we're trying to help. Right, right. Come and, you know, telling us, you know, that we need to get out of there because they want to see their loved ones. So it was a brilliant tactic that they use. And it worked because we packed up everything. You know, we don't, Mm. we want to help. And they, we were trying to explain. But ultimately, yeah, your goal is to get them out so they can see them all the time. Exactly. But at that point, you know, they made them choose. And it becomes, at this point, self-preservation. What, you know, what's Mm. more important to you? Your loved ones? Are you interested in your son to see his father or are you concerned about the people who are in the hunger strike? You know, it's they made him choose. So as form as punishment, they cut off any phone privileges that they had. They this is the uh, hunger strikers. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any contact with the press, uh, lawyers, family members. This coalition, it's uh, made of a lot of groups, ACLU, Pueblos Sin Fronteras, Human Rights, IC4, IJ, this is the Inland Coalition, all kinds of groups. So what we did, we started, we came up with a plan to raise bail money for them to get them out. Mm -hmm. So we have this fundraiser. Through the lawyers, they were able to get hearings and have their bail bonds lowered. 
So something that was more attainable for them, mm. even if they were to pay only 20% of right. the bail bond versus 20% of $35,000. Sure. So they were, the bail bonds were dropped, so we started mobilizing and started up. Uh, have this fundraiser right which is still uh, going reservoir. on right it's still going yeah. on when well, i'll put the on. link in the information i think we're a little bit uh over twenty six thousand. we need to raise about fifty eight thousand to get all of them out so we started getting them out and now this is this is where it starts getting interesting so i'm learning the more i'm involved the more i'm learning how this system operates Adelanto makes about 125 dollar guaranteed per bed, per day, per inmate. Wow. So They don't want to lose anybody. Their, they don't want to lose all the money. So that is why they put all these high bonds on them so they don't get out. So as we started uh, raising the money and coming up with the funds, we had to be looking for companies who will bail them out. There's one, this particular company called Libre by Nexus, which is run by two ex-convicts turned lobbyists uh, turned <laughs> entrepreneurs who made $30 million in profits. So what they came up with, uh, because they're felons, they can't handle any money. So what they do, they collect 20% of the bail bond. They give 15% to a legitimate bail bond company, and they keep 5% for themselves. In the process, to guarantee that whoever they're vouching for does not flee, they put an ankle monitor at a cost of $420 a month. This is a fee that this political asylum or refugees or anybody has to pay on a monthly basis. The people that we're, that we're dealing with, their political asylees, they do not have a work permit. If they are caught working, that's immediate grounds for deportation but they're responsible to pay $420 a month. Oh my goodness, it doesn't even make any sense. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. The uh, GPS tracking system charges this Libre by Nexus $3 a day to monitor. They charge $14, so they make a profit of 11 days, which is the $420 that they, sure. that they pocket. And this is on top of the 5% that they keep for the bail bonds. And they're very proud of themselves. They're I'm hoping sure. to double their income by next year. Uh, as we started releasing them, I became more involved with the uh, post-release needs. They need advocates. Mm -hmm. They need lawyers. They need a place to stay. Right. They need rides from Adelanto. We need to come up with the rest of the money for airplane tickets. They have the sponsors, uh, some of them in Florida, New York, mm -hmm. all over, all okay. over the place. So w when we got them out, we were... Okay, now what do we do now with them? What? Now right. we, we got them out. Now what do we do with them? Right. So there was a couple of ladies that I met. They were housing them. And it just became overwhelming because they were feeding them. They were buying them clothes, shoes. I mean, everything. They sure. need everything. So they put out a call to see if anybody could host them because they wanted to be here for a press re uh, conference before they moved on to be with their sponsors. Mm. I got that email, so I volunteered to go and mm -hmm. help with that. And then I started coordinating some of the uh, needs that they have. Mm -hmm. So uh, the other colleague, Debra, and I have driven one of the refugees uh, to San Diego where he found a church that was willing to sponsor him. And he is one of uh, my focus right now. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have any friends or any family. He's relying on the kindness of all the people who are willing yeah. to help. We're raising funds for him to pay for $420. And they have to pay that until their next hearing. He was released in September, and his hearing is in May. Oh, my goodness. So he's responsible to pay $420 a month. I cannot stress that enough. Oh, my goodness. A month, and he is not allowed to work. Not allowed to work. So we're busting our behinds, coming right. up with the money that we need to pay. So Because right. I guess if they miss one, they just bring them back. Well, they, they'll just keep tacking, tacking fees and tacking fees, and yes, they can go in and pick them up and throw them back in. There was another refugee that we got out. We, another company got involved, and they were able to raise all of the bail bond money. So we got him out, and he doesn't have to have an ankle monitor. Oh, fantastic. And the good thing about that is that when he goes to his hearing, then we get that money back, and that money can be used for somebody for else. Somebody else. That's amazing. So, that's good. Well, if anything, I think what we've learned from just hearing you talk about this is that 
our immigration policy obviously needs some work and needs to be addressed and it needs to be administered properly. I think that in a lot of situations, there's, you know, people yell all the time about programs. Oh, there's too many programs for this and that. But I think at the end of the day, it's not necessarily the program that they're against. It's how it gets administered. And I think with a big bureaucracy like we have here in the U.S., it's kind of like that telephone game. You know, it starts out one way and these this paper shows what the rules are. But by the time it gets to the place where it has to be administered, things have changed. People have different ideas or make assumptions and it doesn't work. So something needs to be changed. Absolutely. So that it can work. Absolutely. Well, thank you for all of the involvement and work and time that you are doing. And again, I will put the links that you provided me for the fundraising and all the information on Adelanto so that people can dive into that a little more closely and and see if they can help as well. But thank you so much for everything that you're doing and everybody that's helping you. Thank you for That's giving amazing. me the opportunity to have a voice for the ones that are sure, able to speak absolutely. up for themselves. Sure, absolutely. And there are so many of those. So having moved here and getting involved in this work, do you feel that that has changed you as a person? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I told my husband within a week of getting involved with Indivisible, I told him, this is me. can you live with this right because I can't ever go back to putting the blindfold that I was so happy to carry and indivisible may cease to exist I don't know what's going to happen the only thing that I'm sure of is that all the work that I've been doing it may be different in the future but I'm not going to stop doing something for people who I think I can help and even I've been trying to help people that I I haven't been able to but I'm going to be out there every day trying to do something to Mm -hmm. to help to make it better right exactly well and that just kind of raises you raises your vibration within you know the universe if I may say that and then that starts to permeate the air around you and people start to change and maybe there are people driving trucks that think they're going to run somebody off the road Mm -hmm. because of what they look like somehow it permeates them or puts them in a situation where they have to rethink how they're operating in their life. It only can start with a small thing. Kind of on that subject, I wanted to, when I first reached out to you, it was kind of funny the response I got (laughs) from you. And I want to read it and then I want to talk about it because part of this, I usually at the end, I ask if you want to answer a question from my niece because I think part of this podcast is about empowering women and you know showing that there's so much that we can do and so much that we are doing and encouraging and inspiring other women to to do the same thing so when I reached out to you and offered it to you you sent back hi Dawn I'd be honored but I don't think I'm as interesting as some of your past interviewees (laughs) and I think that anybody listening to this podcast right now and hearing everything that you're doing and what you just said and talked about would say what is she talking about so kind of in that vein I just want to talk for a few minutes about why do you think as women because I'm guilty of it too why do you think we think that of ourselves or think that we're less interesting than other people what what do you think it is about women that what do you think I think that is how we raise to be, to devalue ourselves as human beings and not just necessarily as, well, you know what, let me, as women, Mm -hmm. we're we're raised to not think that we're as worthy. I know that I'm definitely guilty of that because as I heard you read that, that was as true then as it is now. (laughs) I still feel that way, but I'm working on it. And I think today would have been a great time to... uh, Wearing my T-shirt that says "Smash the uh, Patriarchy." Oh, so that, that right. would, today would have been uh, awesome, and I'm learning to do that. I'm Mexican and raised to be submissive. Mm-hmm. I always been kind of the black sheep of the family, kind of going against the uh, grain and mm-hmm. thinking that uh, no, I can do better than that, or no, why can't I do that? Or sure. so I've been kind of a rebel, but mentally, I don't think that I've reached the uh, level of Mm. total freedom where I think that I'm just as valuable as the person next Mm. to me whether it's a male or female but I gotta give kudos to some of your past interviewees because (laughs) they are amazing and when I thought I heard some of the podcasts and everything that involved like 
Danielle Segura. I mean, look at the wonderful job that she's right. doing. And I was just, yeah. I'm just in awe of her. Mm-hmm. And I just aspire, I think, uh, because I'm so late in getting active in the community and really doing the things that I should have been doing 30 years ago. Well, uh, don't shit on I, yourself, I, I, <laughs> as they say. <laughs> I compare my, they're my benchmarks, and mm-hmm. that's the level that I hope to attain right. one day where people, maybe they'll look at me and like, oh, I wish I could do the things that Yolanda right. Brown does. Well, and that's the so, thing. It's I think we all, in our own time, find our path and our space. And like you said, until this happened, you now are really fired up about doing this stuff. But I think everybody's journey is different. And I think we have to have the experience that we've had to this moment to be who we are here. And like Danielle's doing her part. You're doing your part. I'm going to have Marge Doyle. She's talking next week. And she's definitely doing her part. And we didn't even get to talk about that. Uh, But the level of, you know, the amount of women now that are, you know, just what we're seeing with all the sexual harassment that's being outed and all that kind of stuff it's turning I feel like and I think that's only a good thing and the more each of us contributes like you are we're inspiring other people to also step up and contribute and not be afraid and kind of push those norms that we've been raised with aside and say you know what and and for me sometimes it's I've got a lot more life behind me right now than I have ahead of me. So I need to start thinking <laughs> about, <laughs> right? I need to start thinking about that. You know, I've only got limited time. We all have only limited time. So thank you for coming on. And uh, just uh, uh, no disrespect to my brothers who are out there resisting and fighting sure. the good fight, but I think it's going to be women mm-hmm. who are going to save the world. Right. Yeah, I have a, um, I actually have a, um, she calls herself a change strategist. She helps people. She's like a life coach, but her name is Christine Aller. And she uh, always says, I need to look up the quote so I'm confident on what I'm saying. I almost want to say she's heard it from the Dalai Lama who says it will be the Western woman who saves the world, as you said. So I think we're, we're starting to ramp up and do our part. And the more encouragement that we can give to the women who are coming behind us, that it's never too early to start stepping into your power, if you will. Totally so, agree. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming and talking about Adelanto. That's very important. And thank, thank you. you for the work that you're doing there. That's also very important. So. My pleasure. I only wish I can clone myself. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. It would be so e- much more helpful. <laughs> well, thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank I'm happy you, to know you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening. Next week, my guest is Marge Doyle, and she's running for Congress. I hope you'll join us for the conversation. Our desert community just asks that you send love, light, and blessings and prayers to the family of Melanie Buck. Be kind to one another.